Gospel of John, beginning in verse 20. John, verse 20. John chapter 12, verse 20. John chapter 12, verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So this came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life, Lucifer said, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come into this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your benefit, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may this commandment of Christ become true in us. May be a, a reality to hear the light, to see the light, to obey the light. Grant us, Lord, repentance faith and perseverance, Lord, in the faith. Help us to, to persevere to the end, O Lord, for the sake of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May, may His Word yield in us faith, obedience, repentance, all the things that you desire in us, Father. May your will and purpose be fulfilled in us, O Lord. Lord, we remember this morning the persecuted saints, we pray for shelter, protection, deliverance, Lord, in your providence, all these things. Father, we pray for the sake of Christ, our Savior. To him be power, dominion, and glory forever. Amen. We see so many things in this passage. And uh, today I, I'm going to try to just touch some of the things we see here. It's important that we remember the context. Uh, this is the third Passover. The ministry of the Lord is about to come to to a culmination. Uh, there is there, uh, through the narrative of the Gospel of John. There has been a series of confrontations between him and the leaders of the people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and uh, it has come to a dead on a head on collision, where his signs have demonstrated. And corroborate and solid, solidify his testimony that he is indeed the promised Messiah, him who Moses prophesied about, him of whom it is written in the law that they ought to listen to and they are commanded to obey and hear him and believe in him. And if anyone does not listen to him, he will answer to God just like God dealt with those who rebel against Moses, he's anointed. In the same way, 
now we see that the gloves have come off, if you will, and the Pharisees have rejected him. The leaders have rejected him, and it has been demonstrated without the shadow of a doubt that he is indeed the promised Messiah, as we just read at the last time. Uh, the high priest Caiaphas declares that it's better for one man to die for the whole nation than the whole nation perishes. And we are told that he, he prophesies these by the power of the Holy Spirit. That they are willing to kill him because he has become a nuisance. He has become a stumbling block for them. They cannot stand him anymore. And we have talked about the consequences and, and the reasons and the causes for all this. Right? So we come to this point in his ministry where his fame has crossed the borders of Palestine, has crossed the borders of Judea and the Promised Land, and has even reached the Greek world. Now in this passage we also see embedded you know, a great temptation here, and it's, it's something very important because you see, uh, this group, this group of Greeks, and uh, we are not told where they're from. Some believe they might be from the area of the Decapolis or further uh, west, northwest. The point is that his fame has increased. There is a tremendous buzz in the city of Jerusalem. There is a great expectation. We said last week this expectation was loaded with political significance as well. Messianic significance, there have been intermingled. People expected some kind of revolution to take place, for it is written that the Messiah will restore the kingdom to the people of God. So there was tremendous expectation. There is therefore an increase on his fame, and the pressure is on, and these Greeks come to to see him and want to talk to him. You see, this is a great temptation because it is a temptation to fame, 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 and notoriety. It is great pressure. And that's why, uh, this is why it makes sense, his response to, to Philip and Andrew. That his call is not to be famous. His call is to die, to die. To die for the kingdom of God. And one thing I want to emphasize in this is that dying to self is what is implied. And dying to self means exactly that. That we become lesser. That we get out of the way. That the one who must be glorified is God. Not us. And this is indeed what the Lord has in mind. Now, this is one of the most astonishing passages in the scripture. So often overlooked or misunderstood. Or, or maybe neglected would be a better way to express this. You see, this is one of the most astonishing and most difficult things that Jesus said. This is one of those difficult sayings of Jesus. Not because it is unclear, not because it is not clear enough, but rather because it is so clear and direct that the only way we can reconcile this passage the only way that we can reconcile this passage to the rest of our comfortable Christianity is by dismissing it as something said just to let us see how much grace we need, but not as the very path that we are to follow. This is one of the most difficult passages that the only way we can reconcile what Jesus is saying in this passage it's by dismissing it as only something that is said to show us how much grace we need, but not as the very path set for us to follow. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, 
Now, there are several things here I'd like to outline real quick for us. The first thing is the obvious thing. The time was ready. The time has come. And this is something that appears throughout the Gospel of John when there are several intents to take his life, but he says that his time is not yet. Right? He, t he tells again and again that his time is not yet. But now the time has come. In which we are shown, in which we are told, therefore, that uh, his life, his life was not the, the product of random events, that his life is not tossed in the ocean of chance uh, to see what happens and God just sees his opportunity to, to bring redemption. No, but what this is telling us is that his life, and this is a great example of the sovereignty of God, his life is shorted, his life is predestined, is predetermined by the purposes, by the decrees of God, and now the time has come to, to be fulfilled. Nothing is left to chance. Now, another point here, in a way of our outline, is that there is no there is no sacrifice required but that of Christ for our salvation that there is not a sacrifice there's not a sacrifice required but that of Christ which is perfect for our salvation but because of salvation there is Here's a part that we neglect, especially in American Christianity. There is a sacrifice required because of salvation. Because of salvation. You see, this is the very theme of First Peter. Where we can summarize the letter. You remember when we went through it, the theme is the imitation of Christ. It reminds us of the work of Thomas Compass, the imitation of Christ, can be surmised in one word, sacrifice. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, speaking of the reason why we suffer. Peter says, as you... 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 5. As you come to him, being a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourself, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house with a purpose to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by virtue of Christ Jesus. You understand what that means? Peter is saying that we have come and are being built up into Christ and that there is a purpose for for our being and, and, and being built up. And that purpose is that we ourselves may present to God spiritual sacrifices that are made acceptable to God, not because we can satisfy God in any way, shape, or form with our sacrifices. Notice that in the text, sacrifices are not discarded, are not set aside, and just say, well, you don't need to sacrifice anything. No, what is being said in the text is that sacrifices must be presented, but that they are acceptable only because Christ makes them acceptable. Nevertheless, sacrifices are required. Now, this is radical and counterintuitive, especially for the type of Christianity that we experience in this country, in America. 
this is something completely anti what we know and experience as Christianity in America, where the cost of discipleship, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, is what we will qualify, what he qualified as cheap grace. It costs us nothing. But Peter continues and gives us the reason why this is just a little further down in the same chapter, beginning in verse 20, Peter nails it and leaves. If this verse was taken seriously by the church in the United States, I, I promise you that we will see not a social reform, because that's not the point of Christianity, but we will see a tremendous opposition and persecution of Christians. Because following this to the letter will set us in a collision course with the world. Make no mistake. Listen to what Peter says. He says, for what credit is it if, he says, when you sin and are beaten or punished for it, you endure it. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is something that pleases God and is pleasing in his sight, says Peter. For this, he says, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in his footsteps. You understand that? You understand what that means. This is such a resting, a resting passage. You see, the trust of the passage is very simple. It is a display of Jesus' obedience and commitment, thus setting for us the path that we must follow. You see, if we must understand that it must be followed not in order to gain salvation, right? We, it's not works, works, righteousness, salvation that we are promoting. We, we're quoting the text. But what is being told to us is that it is because we have salvation. This is set as the path that we ought to follow. This is the very reason that the young... Uh, ruler who came to Jesus and asked the question how uh, what can I do to be saved you see we misunderstand that passage so much because we think that Jesus is saying to him oh, do this and do that and you'll be saved no what he's saying is okay so you coming to me you calling me good do you understand that if you call me good it's because you understand who I am you know, this is what is implied, but the, the point is, he said, okay, you want, you want, you want salvation, well, well, follow me, believe in me and follow me, and this is the path, die to yourself and follow me, give, give, give up everything you hold dear, follow me, because that's the path, you cannot carry all that with you, bring, come with me, and he understands that this is the call, this is, this is the path, okay, this is, this is the, what it takes, Die to self, this is the way. And he says, no, I can't do that. It's too much of a sacrifice. So he goes away. He says, very sad. Why is he sad? Because he had religion. He had fulfilled the requirements of his religion. He said so himself. But he understands that it's not about that. He understands that it's about dying to self. And it's too much of a cost. It's too much of a cost. He says, no. And he goes away very sad. Because he cannot choose to follow in his footsteps. 
This passage is very forceful and is confrontational because it demands our highest affection and the forsaking of ourselves. This passage is antithetical to what we see flaunted in our self-emphasized society. It's so counterintuitive to the Facebook Christianity we see today where our highest expression of sacrifice is to post something on Facebook. where self-assertion and self-promoting is coded or disguised with pious language of phraseology. One example of this would be things such as, so I've seen, I've seen, you know, where this is what we do. It says, well, we post something, right? And we want to we wanna get some likes, but we don't want to come, come out all, you know, uh, up front and, and, and just say give me likes and instead this is what we do is say, for example we say today by the grace of God I got to preach at the abortion clinic you know this is one of the things and, and, and we put that out there and then you know people start giving us likes or we say uh, please pray for this and that person I got to share the gospel with today and <laughs> By that, we, we want people to know what we did and give us light. You see, I can't read the hearts. But I can tell you this, based on my own experience interacting with social media. And by that, I mean I'm guilty of this myself. I can assure you that the great majority of such expressions are driven by a heart that craves attention and likes. See, such posts are akin to the prayer of the Pharisee in Luke 18. Lord, I thank you that I am not like the other people. I'm not a sinner. I'm not a cheater and so on. You see, he sought to disguise his self-promoting with pious talk. He first gave thanks to God and then he proceeded to promote himself. Isn't, that, isn't it that what we do on, on Facebook and social media? The name of God and grace of God were only a platform to put himself on display. Isn't it that what we do? Are we using God's grace and gifts to promote ourselves? You see, if our deeds, listen, if our deeds in God's providence are displayed, then so be it. If God in His providence decides that our deeds are known, so be it. But when we seek to promote and display them ourselves, we have crossed the line. Understand that. We have crossed the line. How many, how many Christians, how many of us are throwing away our rewards? For the sake of the instant gratification of a like on Facebook. No, brother, see, be honest. If you want likes, just say, you know what, today I want likes. And if you want likes, uh, if you want to boast of your children and so on and so forth, so put that. You know, today I want to show off my daughter. I did that the other day. You know, because, yeah, I wanted to show it off. But I'm not going to say, well, by God's grace, this and that, and show off my daughter. Because that's really what I'm trying to do. Let's be honest. Last point I want to make today. The people who heard this talk, who heard the words of Christ, uh, they understood, it seems that the text, the context seems to indicate that when he said that he must be lifted up to be glorified, that they understood exactly what he meant. Because even John tells us in the footnote that he said this to, to signify what kind of death he will die. Uh, it seems that they understood that, that being lifted up was a synonym to be put on a cross. And... and and that's why they answer to him and say, well, now uh, he says the scripture, the law, 
says that the Christ remains forever, how can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up, right? So they say, well, in other words, well, the law says that the Christ will remain forever. How can it say that you will be crucified? That's what they say. And they ask the question, who is the Son of Man? It's a theological question because obviously the Son of Man, which was, by the way, we know this, was his favor self-identifying term. This is the way he identified himself the most. This is the title found in Daniel, the book of Daniel, assigned to that messianic figure shown to whom glory is given, who comes before the Ancient of Days and glory is given to him. They understood this to be the Messiah. So they're asking, who is, who is the Son of Man? Who is the Messiah? Now he says that they should, they should grab hold of the light Meaning understanding that wisdom and understanding stands before them. This harkens to the book of Proverbs that speaks of wisdom shouting on the streets and no one listens. He says, listen to the light and walk in the light. Well, there is light. Unless you are taken, are overtaken by darkness. Because those who walk in darkness have no understanding. Last point, they could not understand. And you know, we make, we have done a great disservice in our reform circles when we, when we tower terms such as the inability of man to believe and and the 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 the, the need of of lot of regeneration and, and, and we use this term so loosely and confused because we don't take the time to explain what really is being said because you see we talk in terms of inability that, that we, what we convey to the to the people that listens to us is that we're saying the man lacks something therefore he can't he can't believe and therefore, for the Armenian heart, they said, well, if you lack something, how can God hold accountable? Hold us accountable. We don't have what it takes to believe. But it's not what really is being taught to us in Scripture. What we are told in Scripture is that man has a surplus of evilness that produces the inability to believe. You see, the inability is not the cause it's simply a symptom of the greater problem. It is a heart full of self. Self is evil. Self is anti-God. And self must be overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the preaching of the Word of God, the Gospel, so that we may believe. That's why the Armenian world doesn't understand what we're saying when we say the inability of men to believe. We won't see the light because we don't like it. Because his poses are evil deeds. That's what Christ meant. That's why when we come to the light, we manifest that what is done is done by God. Because God is the one who has, who has overcome us, who has defeated us, and has regenerated our nature. That we may desire, therefore, to come to the light. There's so much in this passage. So much here that we have no, no time to, to address. There's so many things here. Uh, the purpose of his coming again is to glorify God. By what means? And here's what is important. By means of his humiliation, by means of his death, by his loss, we gain. Do you understand that God brings victory by means of defeat? By means of his loss, by the giving up of his life, he brings forth victory. He brings forth salvation. And he doesn't shy from the purpose by which and for which he came. To this very purpose, he came, he says. He came to, to sacrifice himself. That's why he says, whoever loves his life loses it. 
All right, whoever, you see, the way up in the heavenly dichotomy, the way up is the way down. It's contrary to our nature. It's counterintuitive to our instinct. Because for us, the way up is the way up. But with God, the way up is the way down. This is what he's saying. That's why he uses a, the simplest of analogies. He says, a grain of wheat remains alone. Right? It doesn't bring forth fruit. It doesn't multiply itself. It doesn't bring gain, profit, unless it dies. You understand that? It's so arresting. And that's why we seek... Uh, I've seen this in reform. I'm talking about the reform circles. They dismiss this just by saying, well, here Jesus is just showing us the way that we need grace. This is how we see that we need such grace because no one can live up to this standard. But look at the reformers. The John Hosses. The... the, the, the the John Wycliffe's, you know, the William Tyndale's, the Hugh Latimer's, the Thomas Kramer's, the Calvin's, the Knox's, all of our heroes, we know and hear from them because they were willing to sacrifice all. For Christ's sake. And that's why we know them. Because they sought the way down. And it's God who has chosen to honor them. And this is why he says. If anyone serves me. My father will honor him. Not Facebook my friends. Beware. Of the yeast of the Pharisees. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord. Amen.